Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. Christian Wyman is a poet, a former editor of poetry, and teaches at Yale Divinity School. And he has a new book called Zero at the Bone, 50 Entries Against Despair. And I want I think it's going to be interesting even for those of you who don't like poetry or don't think you like poetry or who uh, are intimidated by poetry, I think you should listen to what we're going to talk about today. The book is fascinating, covers many, many topics that we will converse about today. Christian Wyman, thanks for being with us on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Russell. We have two things, at least, in common, uh, Baptist boyhood and uh, the Tree of Life as a favorite movie, and I want to talk, <laughs> I want to talk about both of those uh, a little bit uh, into our conversation. But before before we do that, the book is called Entries Against Despair. What do you mean when you say despair? Well, there's different kinds of despair. Of course, the book covers a lot of different kinds. I guess when I was first thinking of the of the book, it was existential despair that uh, I was thinking about the book broadened to include environmental despair, racial despair, social despair, the different tragedies that we have in our lives that can cause despair. And I realized everything was sort of clustering around that. And the title gave me a focus, something to write towards. You talk about uh, in the book, and I, I really resonated uh, with this, having having grown up Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every day of the week, Southern Baptist, about the, the warnings against lukewarmness uh, that would happen and the way that that would kind of rattle you. You, you talk about being in your bed, thinking about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the unforgivable sin, and wondering about whether you'd committed it or whether you should. (laughs) uh, What what was your background like when it came to the church and to to God? Once we moved back to the small town where my father and mother were raised, which was Snyder, when I was about eight years old, uh, we went to the First Baptist Church of Snyder. And that's where Texas. I went, right? Snyder, Texas. Yeah, all the way, all the way through high school, and it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. The RAs. I mean, our life was the church, and so I grew up in that kind of bubble of religiosity where everyone believed the same thing. There wasn't really even a question of anybody possibly believing something else. And I never met an atheist, as I say in the book, until I went to college. And I was so shocked. You know, I thought he was going to swivel his head around or something. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> but yeah, I, I grew up in very much in a in a bubble. Was it in college that you became an atheist, or was that later on? It was in college. And that was brief. I guess there was a little while when I would have defined myself as an atheist. But once I started writing poetry, I began having experiences that made me question whether I would want to call myself an atheist, and I would even way back then be much more apt to call myself an agnostic. And all of the things that I read, a lot of them were still religious books. I was still reading theology. You know, I read Paul Tillich when I was hmm. an atheist. I was obsessed with uh, with religion um, and with God, even when I would have defined myself as not being a believer. I think about Frederick Buechner talking about how being a novelist changed the way that he saw religion and meaning because writing plots, he started wondering if his life had a plot and if, if life generally had a plot and sort of led him back to, back to God. It was, was the actual art of writing poetry 
part of it or was it specifically what you were reading and, and working on? It was the actual art. It was uh, being aware that there was something coming into my mind that seemed like it wasn't me and suggested an other, an auditor in some of the poems as if that were, were what I was writing toward. And people think that you have an idea and then sit down to write a poem, but that's the way you write an essay. Poems don't work like that. You know, Robert Frost said, if there's no surprise for the writer, there's no surprise for the reader. If a poem doesn't in some way take you somewhere where you weren't expecting to go and really surprise you with its ending, uh, it's not a real poem. It's not, not really worth keeping. And I was having that experience of being shown dimensions of experience and of reality in my work that I denied in my life. And this is one of the big surprises to me in secular art, because so many writers and artists will talk about their work coming from somewhere else mm. and, and having some sense of this dimension of an other experience in their work, but it doesn't translate into anything in their life. The, you just go back right into their life and they're the same people. And uh, I think those experiences, like an experience of joy in our lives, asks something of us. Uh, you know, Jürgen Moltmann said that compassion is the other side of a living joy. And meaning that if we have an, an experience of joy, it ought to ask, it ought to cause us to ask, well, why am I not joyful at other times? Why isn't the world capable of this joy? What can I do to enable this joy to flourish? And for me, I just at some point needed to translate those experiences of joy in my work into something in my life. There was a profile of you in The New Yorker, I, I believe is where this was, where you talked about how difficult that was uh, for you to actually come right out and talk about uh, what was what was happening in terms of that quest for meaning and, and religion. Is that because of what you had experienced as a child and, and the fear of sort of replicating that? Maybe, maybe partly that. Uh, partly, I am in a very secular world and was even more so at the time. And so it's just difficult to come out as a Christian in that world. Mm. That was no doubt part of it. But also, I didn't have a language to talk about faith. I realized that when I began moving towards faith, that I had no language for it. And the old language wasn't, could not suffice for what I was experiencing. And, and so I wrote a whole book called My Bright Abyss, which was basically an effort to find a language for the faith that I was feeling. I imagine that at First Baptist Church there, the King James Bible is what was used. You, you can correct me if I'm I'm wrong, and I wonder if uh, if the the rhythms of the King James Bible, if maybe that was one of the things that alerted you to poetry in the first place. Definitely, definitely, the the rhythm of the King James Bible, especially the Old Testament, was very much in my head. And there, you know, there's a great story. I might have told it in that New York. I can't remember, but. When my father was in medical school in Fort Worth, we belonged to the First Baptist Church of Dallas. And when um, Brother W.A. Criswell was there. Mm -hmm. and one time when I was very young, I guess probably seven, I had written something, a little poem, and we didn't have books in our house, so I don't know where I got the idea for a poem other than a hymn. It must have been I was imitating a hymn. And I had written it down, and the poem was, I love the Lord, and He loves me. I will not forget, and neither will he. Mm. And when the altar call came and people were going down front to be saved, I ran down there away from my parents. And, you know, the church is enormous. And, yeah. and I ran down the aisle and thrust that poem into Brother Criswell's hands directly and ran back. I didn't even wait for him to say anything. I just gave it to him. And... He published it in the Southern Baptist newsletter. It's in there, and and so we have the newsletter from that time. So that's that's uh, that was my first publication at seven years old or whatever it was. That is fascinating. And so you, you didn't even uh, stick around to hear him say, "Lad, thank you for <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the way." Right, and it's a. I mean, it's such a. Uh, it's almost too perfect a story because instead of 
getting saved at that moment, I gave him a poem. Uh, that was my gesture of salvation. And I would struggle with that for a long time, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. That is fascinating. I hesitate to even bring this up because you talk about in Zero at the Bone <laughs> that you resent people <laughs> who, bring this, who bring this up when you're not thinking about it. But you talk about uh, in the book the experience of having cancer and in, in some, I think, some surprising ways. Because at, at one point you talk about the fact that you didn't have this kind of cancer camaraderie, I think is what you you called it, with the other people who were undergoing treatment. And you also talked about, and I found this really interesting, when you said it's actually not the crises that are assaults or um, dangers to your, your faith, your sense of meaning, but, but the endless succession of days in which nothing changes, no one ever changes. What did you mean by that? And, and what sort of thing emerged out of that experience of cancer that you weren't expecting? Yeah, there's maybe two different things there. I think I've lived with cancer for 19 years now and have literally been on my deathbed three times now and thought I was going to die. And that does focus your mind in some ways. In some ways, it obliterates your mind too, though. People make too much of that. Mm. But what I found, but I, I found this not simply related to cancer, but in other areas of life as well, is that faith is easier to maintain in more intense moments. And I mean, we all are familiar with someone who gets saved and they're very enthusiastic. And, and then a couple of years pass and the experience fades a bit. The rapture becomes harder and harder to believe in. And, and it's those ongoing days that it becomes harder and harder to feel God's presence. That's why I've always been moved by Abraham Joshua Heschel's notion that faith is uh, being faithful to the times when we had faith. So that it's a... Uh, discipline of memory and hope. We remember those moments when we had faith and, and endeavor to live in such ways that they become available to us again. When, when I read that section of your book, I immediately thought of Walker Percy in The Moviegoer and then in his talking about uh, The Moviegoer, about everydayness and the kind of uh, despair that can come with everydayness that's dangerous because it doesn't know it's despair. And that once one realizes that, then the quest has started, the, the search has, has started. Do you agree with the way Percy saw that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Sarah Grant, who's a writer I love. People don't really read her much, but they should. But she talks about the questing beast. That's how she uh, describes that feeling that once that you're aware that you're in despair, you're, the first step is taken. And, and that's what my book is about, really. It's about being having an awareness of despair. I mean, that's what Kierkegaard wrote, too, that we all walk yeah. around in this kind of... Yeah, it was the, the epigram uh, to moviegoer, yeah, yeah. was Kierkegaard. Yeah. It seems to me there are three, at least three different angles at which you would look at something like the book of Job. You would look at that as a poet. You would look at that as somebody who is on the quest and you look at it and you could look at it as somebody uh, who has suffered. Am I right? Would there be these different ways of looking at that at that work? And uh, there, there are a lot of people who are really ambivalent about a text such as Job. And, and sometimes it seems that people who are suffering are more ambivalent about it than everyone else because for different reasons. I mean, there, there are some people who say, I don't like how it, how it wraps up at the end. And it seems as though everything has been given back when in fact you can't replace those things that are lost. How, how do you see a text such as the book of Job? Yeah, I go round and round about the book of Job with my friend Miroslav Wolf here at Yale Divinity School. We taught a class called Suffering and we read the book of Job very carefully and argued about it. Yeah, the, uh, that's interesting the way you frame that. Uh, I come at the book in different ways. I wouldn't have thought of it myself, but it's probably true. Um, as a poet, the book of Job is astonishing. 
absolutely astonishing. Like one of the masterworks of all of Western literature, if you take off the beginning and the end, which are prose. It's very mm -hmm. interesting that the that the book begins in prose, then the meat of it is poetry, and then it ends in prose. And the end is clearly tacked on by, I would say, by someone who couldn't stand what they had read and said, this has got to be in differently. This has got to have a different kind of ending. Oh, maybe the author, but it seems like the author, if he wrote that well in the book of Job, he wouldn't tolerate that prosy ending. So I tend to read the book of Job, well, in two ways, really. I, we, you can't just, the, the, book, the book has come down to us at the beginning and the ending. You got to read it that way. But I often think of it as just the, the thing itself in the middle. Perhaps suffering has taught me in some way to read the book of Job. I, people think when I tell them that's my favorite book of the Bible, they say, oh, yeah, because you've suffered. But that's not it at all. It's not, I don't feel like I necessarily learn about suffering from the book of Job. I don't think it's a, a theodicy uh, mm -hmm. at all. I think it's really Job's main question is, where are you, God? Why can't I feel you? Why can't, why can't I feel you close to me? How is all this happening? and you're not there. And eventually he has what I read as a kind of mystical experience in the book of Job where God is so present that it, you know, blasts all of his questions away and, and merely the experience is, is enough. I do think part of what makes the book of Job great is that it will not be pinned down. Like the minute you think you've got a meaning for the book of Job, some part of it slides out and seems to mean something else. And it, it is uh, uh, susceptible to very different interpretations, which can both be true, or multiple interpretations can be true. And I think that's the definition of a good poem, really. I'm not sure I asked, answered your question, Russell. Yeah, no, that, that is very interesting. I'm, I'm wondering because when I when I read Zero at the Bone and some other things that you've uh, written, I sense this, what seems to be a contradiction, but then you actually bring it up as a contradiction or uh, later on uh, in the book, at least implicitly, is there are times when I read some of the things that you say about God and I think, okay, well, he doesn't believe in a personal God. This is more Tillich's ground of being. And then there are other times when I read you and I think, oh, no, no, this is this is a very uh, personal God. And the, the sections about kenosis, about the, the pouring out of uh, incarnation and those sorts of things. Am I right to see some tension there or am I just reading it wrong? No, I think that's right. Tension, confusion, maybe, is what you're putting your, your finger on. I pray to a personal God. I pray as if I've got a personal God. And I certainly go through my life wanting only to be close to God. I think about it all day, every day. It's never out of my mind. It's, it's what I want. Hmm. And so... I often feel my, find myself writing towards that, and I live towards it, but I often, you're right, sometimes I don't believe in it. Sometimes I believe in a ground of being. I believe, I never question the existence of God, I, and I find that, I just find it so boring to have that discussion with people. Mm -hmm. But I do question how, how much can we know God? That's what I think Job is questioning, and, and so that is a real war within me. How much can we know God? And there are times in my life when I have felt very close to God, and there are times in my life when I've been convinced that, not that there is no God, but just that he's too remote, too remote for us to know. I was really struck and moved by the section in the book in which you talk about Jesus and the woman with the issue of blood, because you you framed it in a very different way than, than I've thought about it before. And what I was really uh, struck by is when you 
uh, when you say in response to that, it might be as simple as a phone call to a family member you haven't spoken to in too long. It might be some thorn in the heart of a friend to whom you have not paid sufficient attention. It might be some holy, ordinary encounter you have in the next few hours of this holy, ordinary day when suddenly you feel some power going out of you. What did you mean by that? That essay came from uh, learning that our dog had been had a bullet in him. He he had a cancer, but then this incidental finding right when we discovered the cancer, we learned that he had a bullet lodged in his back, and someone had shot him before we got him. And it led me to think about the kind of wounds that we all carry around, and led me to think about that woman. I was actually preaching at the time. I that that was part of a sermon. Part of that I used for a sermon. And I was preaching on the, that woman, and I had never thought about all those other people around the woman with their own issues, their own pains. And, I mean, you know, why didn't Jesus feel them? And then I thought, well, gosh, eventually he did, felt, felt everyone's pains. That's what he was feeling all the mm-hmm. time. And it's, it's very, this is a, aside from, from what you asked, but it's very moving to think of him feeling that woman's pain because it would have been what he was seeing was her shame and I mean she would have been ashamed and and she would have been if she'd gone to doctors you can imagine what that would have been like and and part of what he was healing in healing her was her shame and yeah then I began to think about the the way we all have our own bullets in us we carry around these pains that are unspoken sometimes unspeakable. And I was just wondering, well, what's, you know, what, what do we do about that? What, what, what is asked of us? And sometimes it seems to me it's the smallest gestures that we heal both ourselves and others by. And I was also thinking about Trump was in the office at the time, and I talk about him in that essay, and I, I was thinking about the hatreds that we let ourselves have and give ourselves over to and how they end up poisoning us. And in fact, every single person has that pain in them. And I think to be a Christian means you can't say, you can't draw this line and say, this person doesn't. You know, this person doesn't have the pain or this person is beyond Jesus's action. It's really every single person. You write about and you almost apologize for mentioning because you you talk about the banality of the need for a poem to be more than something that can be pulled apart and analyzed. This line means this and this line means that, but it has to be experienced in a more holistic way. But this very thing that I encounter, at least among people in in my tribe of uh, evangelical Christianity is that's the hard part often for for folks to get when it comes to for instance preaching is this uh, to to quote Beekner again to to use parables as though you're squeezing the orange juice out of the orange and then throwing away the rind and and it is difficult for people to understand that how how would you help somebody who maybe says, I'm really intimidated by poetry. I don't know a lot about it, but I need to be able to hear the Bible better in terms of of what's actually being uh, said. And I need to be able to, to hear my life better. What would you say to that person to help them to, to get a sense of the poetic? Well, reading aloud is the first thing. You've got to Basil Bunting once said that half of the misconceptions about poetry could be dispensed with if people just read read aloud. So I tell all my students, you have to read aloud if you're reading poetry. And, and so find yourself somewhere where other people aren't in the room if you're going to be embarrassed. But you, you've got to read it aloud. And I read the Bible aloud, not necessarily that much of the New Testament, not always that. That's not poetry. But one third of the Old Testament is poetry, and that you really do have to treat it as such, which you have to read it aloud. You know, I'm very good at 
leading people into poetry. And I have all kinds of ways of introducing them to poems that it's not a fallacy that poetry is difficult because there is a lot of poetry that is difficult. And it's not merely modern poetry. Milton, Shakespeare is difficult. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have some guidance towards something like that. But it's also true that there is a lot of poetry that's not difficult. It's almost, some of it's too easy. But there's a whole lot of poetry for every level. This is why every culture that we know of has had poetry. It's just a, a, a freak of ours that it's in universities. It's been relegated to universities. It's normally very much in the culture and a thing of the people as it was. It's, it's why the Bible is so much in poetry. So I could, you know, I could tell you all kinds of poems that, that I think people would find easy to read and, and uh, would be a way in. The Bible is tougher. I say it's poetry, but it, it, it asks to be more than poetry. You don't read William Wordsworth and the book of Job, and especially the book of Mark, in the same way. Mm. And so that's, that's a very different element, and, and it's something I struggle with a lot, is the proper way to read the Bible. I'm a very good reader. I read a ton. And, and yet, reading the Bible for me is often... And I, I read the Bible a lot, but reading the Bible for me is often difficult because I can't always tell how I'm supposed to read it. Like, um, you know, Jesus, we get Jesus's thoughts when he goes off by himself to pray. That's a fictional technique. That It's as if suddenly we're reading a book of fiction. The writer can't have known those thoughts, and so he's projecting them. And how does that fit in with the other parts of the story. When does fiction start and fiction end? It's, I find it very difficult to tell. Mm. Let me ask you a question. I, I read the, I was reading the Acts yesterday and I'm forgetting the guy's name, but what's the guy's name who falls asleep when Paul is, is uh, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, he falls sound asleep. He's literally killed, you know, killed, uh, bored to death by by a sermon. <laughs> and Paul goes down and raises him up, and then and then just continues, gets goes on with his sermon and uh, resurrects the guy. Yeah, uh, is this? See, when I'm reading that, that seems to me comical. Like this is a this is a joke put in here. You know, how, how would you say that we're meant to read a segment like that? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's comical in the sense of, of fictional, but I do think it's, it's intended to be comical in the sense of Paul. Not only do you have this, uh, this fellow who falls asleep and his name now is permanently <laughs> the fact poor guy falls asleep. We're talking about him now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, th that's quite a thing to be known for. So I do think that is comical and also just this drivenness of Paul. Okay, we've taken care of that. We're going to keep on going. Yeah, I, I, I laugh at that section every time I every time I read it for all of those reasons. And there are probably a thousand more layers that I, I don't even see. Yeah. What about for preaching? You teach right now in a divinity school uh, context, so there are going to be many students there who are going to be expected to preach or teach in some way. And you you talk about in the book being frustrated with preaching, for instance, about um, the woman caught in adultery, Jesus uh, scribbling in the sand uh, there. What should preachers learn from poetry or from poets that they're missing right now? Maybe when to be baffled is a good one. I, I was in church the last, just a little while ago, but there were two successive weeks when the priest talked about the virgins who, they don't trim their wicks, they're not ready for Jesus, you know, and or not, it's part of a parable, it's not, that, not Jesus, but not ready for the master who comes. And, and he said that he'd been baffled by that for 40 years that maybe what they did wrong is they just didn't wait and trust in God. And that instead of going off to try to buy stuff at midnight, because what store would be open at midnight, or instead of uh, rushing about, that if they had waited, maybe that's the le one lesson we're meant to get from that. And right or wrong, I thought it was uh, very interesting the way he told us that he hadn't known how to interpret it for 40 years. He's an old man, he's 80 something years old. and. Again, I thought he did a very admirable thing because he looked at it and he said he was baffled by it and didn't know what to make of it. 
and had never known what to make of it. And But if this was the truth of, of God, then he had wasted his whole life, and he was sure that he hadn't wasted his whole life. And uh, he gave a very honest, I thought, reaction to it. And rather than squeezing a meaning that I think the people would have found false, but he didn't lie to us. One of the reasons I think that some people are uh, intimidated by or reluctant to look at poetry is because of the experience they had with it in high school. Yeah. And um, having to sort of do autopsies on poems and to memorize them. Do you think it's helpful to, whether we're talking about poetry or biblical poetry or biblical text, do you think it's helpful to memorize or is it better to sort of come at it sideways where maybe you memorize it, but it's an accidental memorization that comes through familiarity? Or is there is there something to the discipline of memorizing, memorizing these words and repeating them back? Oh, I think it's a great discipline. I have all my students do it. If they're late for class, they have to memorize a sonnet for the next class. Mm. But that but that's part of the class is that they have to memorize things, even in my classes that aren't poetry. I think it's a great discipline. It has helped me so much. It um, gives you something solid to hold on to in your mind and to counter the, this, the storm of crud that we are dealing with all the time. And unlike a novel, a poem is something that you can hold and carry with you. And one of my frustrations with novels is that I love them, but I forget them. I forget plots a week after I've read them. Mm-hmm. And a poem is something that you can carry with you and have. And it can be something, I, mean, I tell my students, memorize something that you want in your head for good. And mm-hmm. I don't assign what they have to memorize. So it, it can be, I mean, it's been incredibly important for my intellectual and spiritual life. Is there a technique for memorizing or is it just reading and rereading and rereading? You know, my technique is to do, I do one line and two lines and three lines and I have get one at a time, you know, mm-hmm. and then I do it over and over and over until I can visualize it. And then when I can visualize it, then I can see if I'm reciting, I can see the next line and you have to get, there's a layer of memory that's sort of superficial where you can maybe remember it a day or two later or something, but you have to get it embed it into your mind and it gets harder as you get older. I mean, I could do it like that when I was young and now it's, it's pretty tough, but it's still, it's really, and it's also really, really good for our brains just to uh, have that discipline and that practice. Let's talk about Tree of Life. You, you talk about it a little bit uh, in the book near the end and it is, it's an unusual movie for me in that the first time I saw it, I hated it, and I couldn't make sense of it. I think I was expecting a more narrative movie or, or something. I don't know why. I didn't like it. But the the next time I saw it, and it's one of those rare movies, I, I usually don't watch films over again, but I have seen that film maybe, I don't know. Uh, eight or ten times since then, and it's now one of my favorite films. And you write about it and and say, I thought this was really well put. What is more memorable about Tree of Life in the end is not its unified vision, but the intuition it enables, and it must remain an intuition, that all of life and creation might inhere and cohere within an instant. And that instant is, so to speak, imperishable. It remains not simply accessible to memory, but viscerally available. I found that really moving, and I, I wonder if if you can talk about what that might mean for someone to to have that intuition of the the cohering in an instant. Oh, I think we're given it in all kinds of ways in our lives that we just blow right past. You talk about being in unconscious despair. We're also sometimes in unconscious joy. I think um, we're going through our lives and being given gifts that we just go right past and and that's what art is so good at is arresting those moments and making you making you realize in your own life maybe what you're missing like when i saw that that film and like you i had some resistance the first time that i saw it it's not it's a film that it's not 
sort of immediately seductive. It doesn't like grab you in any way. You know, it really just demands your attention. But when I first saw it, it I was so riveted by those middle sections in Texas. Mm -hmm. I think I would have been riveted even if I wasn't from that area. But being from there was it was just shocking to me because it was as if the, it was as if the reality glimmered and reality does glimmer in moments when we are able to see it. I mean, imagine what existence would be like if we were really able to feel God all the time, if you were really able to see, because I take it that reality is, I take the incarnation seriously and reality is expressing God is in it. We are, we are seeing God in reality and, and think of what existence would be like if you could see that all the time. And I think he's so great because he, he shows you the kingdom inside of you. He shows you the, he shows you what you could see all the time, or how God might exist if we could pay attention. I want to show you one poem, very short poem, and this is a good one for um, people who might find poetry too difficult. And this is an, an anthology I did called Joy. It's just a hundred poems, and it's by a woman named Sarah Lindsay. It's very short. She's slicing ripe white peaches into the Tony the Tiger Bowl and dropping slivers for the dog, poised, vibrating by her foot to stop their fall, when she spots it, camouflaged, a glimmer, and then full-on, happiness, flashing blunt, soft wings inside her as if it wants to escape again. I hope I said that the poem is called Small Moth. I might not have, but it, but she's slicing... You know, I've had little kids, and you're you're going through your daily things, and uh, it's not always blissful. And and she's slicing bananas into the Tony the Tiger Bowl, and and suddenly she sees this little moth, and in the poem she calls it happiness. What she's seeing suddenly is happiness, and it's uh, plashing that weird word there, plashing. The only word in that poem that's at all strange, mm -hmm. suggesting another element almost, as if it's. We're suddenly underwater, and and she sees happiness inside her as if it wants to escape again. And I think the reason I put this into a anthology of poems about joy is because I think she's having a moment of joy, which I I take as a moment of chirological time coming up and down, and and it illuminates chronological time, happiness, which is happiness and joy are different. I take joy to be vertical, intruding into our life, and happiness lets us see the line linearity of our life. And so she has this moment of joy, and it lets her see that she's actually happy, but she didn't Ooh. see it before. She didn't see her happiness. And I think that's true for a lot of us. We're unconsciously joyful, maybe. That is more timely than you know, because I, I've been thinking about a lot, and I, I mentioned uh, maybe here this experience over Christmas, and I've had this happen a few times in my life, not many, but a few times, where I was sitting at the table with my wife and sons, and suddenly people people were talking with one another, and just suddenly, just for an instant, it was as though I was an observer, and just thinking, this is unspeakably joyful. And uh, it was just one of those little, Elliot would say, hints and guesses <laughs> that, yeah. would, that would come in. But it was, it was, I think, exactly what you're talking about, that sense of unconscious joy. Yeah. And I wonder if we are unconscious to it because of something wrong with us as human beings and that we're ungrateful. Or is it because we, we really couldn't handle the glittering reality of it all? Yeah, I yeah I don't know. That's that's well framed. I think. Yeah, I mean I do believe in sin. We are suffering under that, but could we handle it? You know, could you could you actually be Nietzsche thought that you should go through life? You know, it, it was almost as like every instant is this kind of existential, bam bam. Could you really live like that? Uh, probably not. I wonder, I didn't ask you to do this uh, beforehand, and if you don't want to, that is perfectly fine. But I was wondering if you could read or recite one of your poems for us as we end. Sure, sure. Why don't I um, 
I can recite it, but I'm probably not going to. I, I, I actually, people don't believe me when I say this, but I actually try to forget my own poems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to have them in my head. Why? Uh, it's just they need. I want the next one. I need the next one. I need a different sound, and I can't. I can't. It's too much to carry around, really. So I, I memorize other people's. Hmm. But here's a poem about that I wrote w when I was returning to Christianity, and and it starts with the word incurable, and that is about cancer for me. But the poem need not be about that. We are all incurable in some way just from being human. And this is a guy sitting at a window and he sees a tree explode into birds. So suddenly there's just a flock, you know, the birds were covering all the limbs and suddenly there's just a, the birds leave the tree. Incurable and unbelieving in any truth, but the truth of grieving. I saw a tree inside a tree rise kaleidoscopically as if the leaves had livelier ghosts. I pressed my face as close to the pain as I could get to watch that fitful, fluent spirit that seemed a single being undefined or countless beings of one mind, haul its strange cohesion beyond the limits of my vision over the house heavenwards. Of course I knew those leaves were birds. Of course that old tree stood exactly as it had and would, but why should it seem fuller now? And though a man's mind might endow even a tree with some excess of life to which a man seems witness, that life is not the life of men. And that is where the joy came in. Mm. And that is one of those poems that really taught me something, that I was expecting to write a poem about despair, incurable and unbelieving, and it exploded into joy. Mm. Christian Wyman, author of Zero at the Bone, 50 Entries Against Despair. Chris, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Russell. If you enjoy The Russell Moore Show, take a second to share this episode with a friend or leave a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host is Russell Moore. Produced by Ashley Hales. Associate producers are Abby Perry and Mackenzie Hill. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering provided by Dan Phelps. Video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. Thank you.